Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the final bar today. My guest is Jeff Greenblatt from Lucas Wave International, giving us his take using uh, uh, the uh, numerical approach to, uh, to understanding timing and, uh, and price movements. Uh, also, we'll just be digesting this movement in the markets. We've had sort of a stabilization day, a big gap higher, a sell-off into the late morning, and then we sort of finished right in the midpoint of the range. Yesterday, we talked about three key stocks to watch, and they're sort of in that same range. So I think we have to wait to see which way we break. Do we resolve higher? Do we break to new swing highs? Or do stocks start to break those key 200-day moving averages? We'll look at those charts together. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the final bar. This is your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at stockcharts.com in Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close to make sense of these markets from a technical perspective. Focus on the trends, focus on the momentum, focus on key price levels that should be of interest to you, and most importantly, connect to what we're seeing today with the longer term trend. When I think about the environment today, we sort of have that follow through from yesterday, right? We had the big sell off going into the end of last week, a nice recovery day yesterday, today, a further, uh, you know, sort of a follow through of sorts, but we sort of finished in the midpoint of the range here. So it's not like we finished more toward the highs, suggesting buying into the close. It wasn't a big distribution into the close. It was a rare day where we sort of finished right in the middle of the range. So I don't know if there's a real directional signal from today, except the fact that we closed higher than yesterday for sure. The S&P actually finishing up almost 2%. So we'll dig into all those themes later. I did want to point out, though, the uh, upcoming schedule on this show on the final bar and elsewhere on Stock Charts TV. So today, as I mentioned, we have Jeff Greenblatt joining us uh, shortly. Tomorrow, we have uh, Jay Pettit uh, joining us um, uh, from Charts Avenue in Singapore. On Thursday, we have Bruce Powers joining us from the Atero Group. Next week, we have Sam Burns from Mill Street Research in Boston, and then Chris Brecher from Brecher Trading. On Monday, uh, this coming Monday, uh, we sat down with Tony Hansen at a recent Money Show. So our latest episode of Behind the Charts is gonna feature my conversation with Tony. What I love most, most about that conversation, Tony had a tendency to illustrate price movements with her hands in a very straightforward and meaningful way that was actually really helpful, showing different patterns and, and how to think about them. So you're not going to miss that conversation with Tony Hansen coming up this, uh, this Monday, the 22nd. So let's get to the market recap. As I mentioned, you know, the S&P sort of finished directionally flat if you look at the, 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 the trading day, the bulk of the trading day from the open, that first hour as we settled into a range, we sort of finished in the midpoint of that, but that entire range was higher than yesterday. So the S&P finishing up almost 2% uh, higher uh, to close around 31.25. Uh, the NASDAQ uh, 100 up a little bit less than that, but still up uh, one and three quarters percent, so around 99.49 for the NASDAQ 100. The VIX a little lower, back down below 34 uh, after the close. Mid caps, small caps up a little more. So small caps led the way higher, two and a half percent. Yesterday, one of the charts we looked at was the uh, IWM looking at small caps and that relative outperformance and the price pattern that we've seen coming out of the, the market lows. And again, days like this feel sort of slow and steady bull market-ish. Um, you compare that to last Thursday, Friday, which was certainly much more of a, a distribution uh, sort of feel. Let's look at a chart of the S&P 500. And, and again, what I mentioned uh, you know, yesterday, I think was, you know, as we did our, our sort of three-pronged approach, top down, bottom up, and, and sector rotation uh, as well, I think what we've seen in the last week sort of validates both the bullish and bearish argument right now, which is why I'm so focused on the range that we've now established. If you're bullish, you see this recent uh, sort of down move as a much needed pullback, a healthy retracement that will allow us to go to, uh, to further highs because you need, you need at some point to sort of stop and take a breath of fresh air before you continue on. You can't just go vertical or else bad things tend to happen. If you're bearish though, you finally got the validation of a huge down day, 95% of stocks closing lower last Thursday. And all of a sudden it felt like the beginning of something much deeper. So at this point, I think it, it's, it, it's, to be honest, it's decidedly neutral. You know, Gun to my head, what's the overall trend? I think as the market continues to make higher highs and higher lows, 
trend is positive by definition. And so I think you have to see this most recent pullback as a higher low, which is in, certainly what it is coming off the lows from, uh, from the second week in, in May. If and when we break down through that 3,000 level, break down through the swing low from the last couple of days, and finally break down through 2950, that's sort of the line in the sand in, in my perspective. I think that will tell you that there's much further downside to be, to be had. And I think, I think bears will be very much validated at that point. Um, I, but however, again, I, until then, I think you continue to see this stepwise motion and, and the stock market continues to make new highs. It makes higher lows when it pulls back. And, and that's so far what it's, uh, what it's done here. Um, you know, looking at uh, the rest of the market and how things sort of played out today, we talked about the broad market uh, movements on the equity side in terms of bonds. Bonds finished lower today, uh, and most of that came uh, out of the open with the TLT down uh, pretty significantly below 159. Finished down 1.5% in the 10-year yield up to uh, over 75 basis points. On the commodity side, gold actually ended up finishing flat. It was down a lot right out of the open, but sort of fluctuated. So commodities as a group essentially flat, although oil prices uh, moved higher for sure, with the USO up uh, almost 2.5%. Looking at sector rotation, energy up almost 3% today, followed by healthcare, followed by technology. On the downside, you had utilities, financials, communication services. Interesting, one of the three charts we talked about yesterday is being sort of a key bellwether uh, stock or I guess, um, uh, you know, a bellwether uh, indication. What, you know, whether this stocks like Morgan Stanley are able to hold their 200 day, I think will be very, very telling. Uh, you know, gapped uh, up at the open, but sort of uh, traded down into yesterday's range, closed below the open. So it sort of had this, this um, you know, a, a lot of charts have this feel today, which is sort of a nice, rally from yesterday, which is good. Uh, and originally at the open sort of gapped higher and it felt like we might retest the, the swing highs today. But if you look, it was a little more distributive, meaning the, the, the range came down a little bit. We closed below the open. So in the short term, it was sort of that, you know, short, short term rotation more to, uh, to, the, to the downside. But again, still finished above yesterday's close, which I think is, uh, is, worth, uh, is worth paying attention to. Looking down at some other themes that we uh, that we uh, that we can identify, uh, I think in terms of groups that did well today, steel stocks within the material sector were number one. But there's some other groups that are actually kind of interesting. Apparel retailers were number two. This is in consumer discretionary. Pharmaceutical stocks were one of the top ten sectors within healthcare. Heavy construction within industrials. Um, you know, you had a number of uh, consumer discretionary groups. Actually, four of the top ten. Industry groups are within consumer discretionary. Home improvement retailers, uh, that's things like Lowe's, Home Depot, clothing and accessories, uh, furnishings, all finishing in the, uh, in the top 10 uh, just today. So, so some of those more offense-oriented uh, groups within consumer discretionary are actually doing pretty well today, kind of following through to the upside. On the downside, it was the mining stocks within materials, also the paper group uh, within materials that finished, uh, finished weakest. Uh, again, gold mining stocks had been such a great uh, relative performer with Newmont Mining being one of the top 10 stocks, which felt incredibly defensive. That sort of changed now. Those have rotated off and have started to really uh, underperform as well. A number of utility groups you can see in the, in the, uh, in the bottom 10 uh, when you look at the, uh, at the list as well. You know, when I'm thinking about the, the, the market right now and, and where we're at sort of in this range, it, it certainly feels like a, a waiting, uh, we're, we're in the waiting room and you're not quite sure 100% uh, what's going to happen. So I'm going to finish off the market recap, just looking at a little bit of the, the breadth read from what I'm seeing. You know, when I'm looking at the cumulative advanced decline lines, it actually feels relatively constructive only because we continue to make higher highs and higher lows. And just like the S&P has pulled back to the 200 day on a closing basis and moving higher, that still fits in with a long-term uptrend. You can see that the cumulative advanced decline lines continue to make higher highs and higher lows. And again, until that pattern changes, which is why at the beginning of May, it felt like it might be a deeper distribution, uh, but result higher. And, and that's, where, uh, that's where we're at now. So until we fail to establish a higher high, uh, the, the uh, advanced decline line certainly suggesting uh, the path of least resistance is, uh, is higher. You know, this is a chart that uh, I've talked about, I think if I remember right, I actually made it as one of the, the three and three, looking at breadth in the form of stocks above their 200 day moving average. I had made a comment uh, not too long ago um, about uh, looking at the percent of stocks above their 200 day. And in general, bullish phases tend to see over half of stocks above their 200 day moving average. And if you look at these extended bull market phases, especially coming out of major bottoming patterns in 2011 and in 2015 to 16, you can see that the indicator rotated back above 
the 50% line. And that ended up being, you know, the beginning of that extended bull run that happened uh, afterwards. And I thought it was interesting that that happened at the beginning of 2019. That's after the 2018 and December uh, low. You can see that rotated back higher. That was the, uh, the, the cyclical bull uh, last year. And then you can see that we rotated below the 200, uh, below the 50% line uh, here in February to, uh, to March, which signified this rotation more to a, a bearish phase. Just in the last couple of weeks, we rotated way above that, uh, that level and got up to almost 70% of stocks above their 200 day. But in an example of something that happens actually very rarely, we whipped right back uh, lower and went, and went back, uh, back below it. You've had the opposite where you've been well above and you've rotated below uh, only to be whipsawed and returned back to the positive side, that's what happened in 2014. We have sort of had the op opposite here. So I don't know if that necessarily has great predictive value only because it, we haven't had a lot of observations of that. But in general, for me, I'm gonna feel better on the long side if this is above 50%, which means over half of S&P names are above their 200 day moving average. It's not the case anymore, We're back uh, around 41%. It might've changed a little bit, that's not updated for today's close, but I think it's, uh, it's worth noting. And then finally, you know, one of the three stocks we talked about yesterday was Applied Materials, AMAT. And I think the relative strength of semiconductors continues to hold up. The long-term trend continues to be strong. And again, as long as that's going higher, that's sort of the backbone of, uh, of most of what we do. And now, especially working remotely, we're relying on, on basically the power of semiconductors to, uh, to do most of what we, uh, what we need as employees working remotely. Uh, and so that group continuing to do well certainly see, speaks to um, some underlying strength in the equity universe. That group tends to do well in uh, in bull phases in the uh, in the market, which is another reason why overall I think the uh, it certainly feels like uh, like the uptrend continues to persist until it doesn't, until we see some sort of uh, breakdown in price or uh, momentum. We're going to take a quick commercial break. Back with my guest Jeff Greenblatt from Lucas Wave International. We'll see you in a minute. everyone. Welcome back to the final bar. This is your host, Dave Keller here at stockcharts.com. Thanks so much for joining us every weekday for the show to uh, break down the, uh, the market action from a technical perspective. We're going to do a mailbag segment a little later in this episode. As a reminder, we get all of your questions uh, from, from you, the viewers. Uh, just shoot us an email, the final bar at stockcharts.com. We'd love to hear from you and we'll, we'll grab some of those uh, questions and address them on the air uh, later this week. I want to welcome on my guest, Jeff Greenblatt. Jeff's joining us from uh, uh, Lucas Wave International. And I've learned <laughs> from talking with Jeff before the episode, got his start uh, analyzing markets on the public chart list within StockCharts.com. So Jeff, welcome back to StockCharts and thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. And yes, I did parlay the public, uh, the public list page into a book contract. So that's, a, you know, that's an interesting story for another day. <laughs> Good for you, and, and congrats again on, on your successes in, in, in Lucas Wave International. I'm super excited to hear what you have to say. You sent a couple charts ahead of time. The first one's actually looking at the U.S. dollar. Pretty long-term chart. We're going back to 2005-ish here. What is it? What, tell us about what you're seeing here. Well, what you had you had a guest on a couple of weeks ago who had uh, one of his long-term charts, and this one struck me pretty seriously. You don't have to look at all the different Andrews channels that I have on the chart. The only thing you need to be concerned about is that from the 2008 low, this is a 144-month high. And those of you who do cycle work with Fibonacci will know that when you get the turn at 144, it could be significant. Now, this isn't a daily or a weekly. This is a monthly chart. So it's very significant. And the reason it caught my eye is I don't see this very often. But the last time that I did see an important chart with a 144 month high was the corn chart back in 2012. And once that one followed through, which this one has, it dropped 60% over the next two years. This isn't a prediction. You never no. However, there is precedent and it's in motion. And if 
you were to look at a daily chart, you would see some serious technical damage. It has broken down from a two month range and is in a serious downtrend. You know, it's a, it's a, such a great chart, and it reminds me, Jeff, your your work of talking to to GAN analysts who focus a lot on the on the time cycles. And uh, you know, it's interesting that the amount of time that's passed to get to a 144 month high, but the cycles have have played out in a, in a lot of different charts in a lot of different places. We've certainly seen weakness in the dollar um, since that since that has hit. Now, chart number two is uh, switching gears a little bit to the equity side. Uh, tell us about the Dow Industrials and uh, and where you're seeing things here. Okay, well, we have a, you know, we have a very interesting stock market. We have, well, I don't really believe in what they're saying on television about this recovery. Because, you know, they were so excited about two and a half million jobs being created two weeks ago. But who's really talking about the 30 some odd million jobs that they lost? It's kind of like the Cincinnati Bengals being down 27 nothing in the third quarter and they score a touchdown. And gee, now they're only down 20 points. But since they got the first pick in the draft, we all knew that they were going to lose. Now, as far as this chart is concerned, what you'll also see is another Fibonacci cycle from the low in March, which had turned perfectly on the GAN master calendar uh, for the entire year, which is the seasonal change point around the, the, you know, from winter to spring. This one was up 54 days. Now for a 54 or a 55 day cycle to have some teeth to it, we look at the entire pattern and we want to see if there is some other vibration, major vibration in the pattern that is resonating with that 55 day cycle uh, plus or minus one margin of error. And we see the range, which was 11 uh, is 11,355. So that caught my attention. Now what's catching my attention is the gap down. Yeah, it has, you know, it, it's held the line and uh, we are in a situation right now where we have the fed propping this market up to a point that we have never, ever seen before. And what did happen yesterday? The market really took off when they said that they're going to start buying uh, corporate bonds. I mean, no, we've never seen such a thing. So right now, I would say that the low that we've hit in the last couple of days, it has some sort of a Kairos uh, cycle to it. However, th this you know, I, until I see them able to overcome this gap down, I, I have to be a little bit more bearish than bullish. However, overall, I would think that we could stay in the range that we've achieved until we come to the graveyard for stocks come September. You know, it's interesting. And, um, you know, it, it, just to be clear, for those that aren't f as familiar with cycle work, Jeff, so when you're, when you're illustrating sort of this 54, 55 day point, this is saying 55 days from the, from the low, right, from the March 23rd low. And the cycle coming due doesn't necessarily, you know, have a bullish or bearish uh, directional indication, but it's more of a turning point relative to the trend leading up to that cycle. Is that correct? Well, it could be if it does, if it, see, there's all kinds of cycles, but, and, and, and in my work with traders over the last 10 or 15 years, I try to teach people just because you see a cycle doesn't mean you should front run the bars. You always need the follow through, which in terms of the candlesticks, you want to see a good candlestick reversal formation with, with the gap down. That's what we have right now. So if the, you know, for for the bullish case, and I know you presented the bullish case and the bearish case in your open, we do have some follow through. And for the bullish case to get back on track, which has absolutely no relation to the economy whatsoever, it's going to have to uh, overcome this gap down. I think you're and we don't know that it could do that. It's a it's a great take, and I listen. I appreciate your work with cycles. I think that's a that's an area of of trading. I think people tend to under focus on. Um, so your work is uh, is very well received. Jeff, we're well, out of time. You. Listen, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you, to be honest, for throwing the Cincinnati Bengals under the bus. I'm a lifelong Browns fan, so that made me feel very good. <laughs> um, but uh, but listen, pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks for uh, for joining us, and we we'll look forward to having you again on uh, on soon. All right. Well, thanks for having me.
That was Jeff Greenblatt joining us from Lucas Wave International. And, you know, it's funny, I've, you know, as, if you've followed my show for a while, you know, I don't tend to refer to cycles very often. And for me, though, I find them to be really, really valuable. And what I have found is I don't necessarily focus on them as much as part of my process. I make a point of following the work of people like Jeff Greenblatt, who follow the cycles closely. Um, and I've done that for, for most of my career because I found it so helpful to compare what you're seeing with the cycles with what I'm seeing with, uh, with the charts themselves. But I think Jeff's comments about focusing on price along with the cycle is really, really valuable. Um, so, uh, so message well received. Jeff, thanks for joining us today. We're gonna move on to, uh, to our mailbag segment. So as you know, the final bar mailbag is, a, is our opportunity to hear from you. Uh, we can get your questions at any time via email, thefinalbar at stockcharts.com or hit us on Twitter in a comment, just tag us at Final Bar SCTV. We get so many good questions from uh, many of you. We really, really appreciate you taking the time to send some, uh, some questions in. Let's get right to it. Question number one uh, is, is dealing with um, uh, resistance becoming support. How do I deal with uh, if, a, if a stock hits a resistance level and then trades above it, comes back to it, can that be a, 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 uh, considered a support level? It's actually a really good question. Um, so if I'm going to go here, the question in particular was on, whoops, the URL, hold on. So here we're seeing a stock that rallied out of the March lows, uh, right, so hit resistance here in late April, came off, broke above it here in, uh, in mid-May, and then retested that same level. And, uh, and I've heard that talked about in different ways. One of the things we've talked about is... Uh, uh, polarity, which is basically a, a, a support level becomes a resistance level or a resistance level becomes a support level. I think the logic behind that occurring is that the markets have a memory. People, you know, in, investors, traders in a particular name uh, supposedly would have a focus on a particular price point, especially if it's a meaningful turning point. And so stocks will tend to zero in on those key uh, peaks and valleys. And that's why a lot of uh, technical work is built on some of those key turning points on the peaks and valleys. I always talk about higher highs and higher lows, and it's focusing on these little swing highs and lows. So the answer to your question is absolutely. And I think what's interesting with a chart like this is you have a confluence of support levels. It's, it's the level here, which was basically right around 200, uh, which was the peak from April. That's sort of the, uh, the retest right here. And it's also the 200 day moving average. So that level, if you're thinking of a line in the sand, that makes a ton of sense. And this is similar to some of the charts we've talked about uh, yesterday in yesterday's show, Morgan Stanley and um, Applied Materials and, uh, and others, which had you know sort of retesting a 200 day moving average and now below the recent swing high. And I'd be very interested to see, do we break above 220? Do we break below 200? And I would suspect that the direction of that breakout will tell you the direction of momentum soon afterwards. Really good question. Question number two is on relative strength. And a lot of the charts I use, I have relative performance of the stock to the spiders on the bottom of the chart. Um, with the uh, with the charts on stock charts, how do I actually do that? Oh yeah, good, okay, sure. So here I'm actually on this chart of Burlington at the bottom, almost all my charts have relative strength, which is the ratio of the stock versus the uh, SPY. There are a couple different ways to, uh, to do it. Um, what you wanna do is at the bottom of the chart, there's a section called indicators. You wanna use an indicator called price or price dash performance. I use that because then it's based on percentages. So it's easy to see how a stock has outperformed or underperformed uh, relative to a benchmark. And then you can either type in the symbol like B-U-R-L uh, colon S-P-Y, uh, but it's actually pretty smart. So you can do dollar sign symbol, um, dollar sign sector, anything like that. And what that'll do is it'll automatically bring in here, the symbol is Burlington, the sector is XLY. Um, so it actually, if you use dollar sign sector, dollar sign symbol, you can put a particular benchmark in there and it'll update the symbol or, or whatever for, uh, for the, the security that you're looking at. But I, I cannot stress enough that looking at the relative performance of a stock versus other stocks is really important, especially now when it feels like so many charts feel very similar. The relative strength is what should help you uh, differentiate things. Third question on Qualcomm. I have a feeling Qualcomm may be about to break out after hitting resistance. Uh, okay, let's take a look at this one. QCOM, here's the chart. Right, hitting that 92 uh, handle coming off. feel like it might be breaking out. How would you measure the breakout, the next target, et cetera? So 
Really good question. I, you know, Qualcomm is one of those charts that you've seen in technology right now where they've sort of round tripped, right? They sold off from January or February down to the March lows. They've now come right back to those highs or really near uh, those highs. And, and so the question is what next? So this is actually really similar or really close to a pattern called a cup and handle pattern which is a big rounding bottom pattern with a pretty consistent resistance level and then a shorter uh, correction. And this is the cup holding your coffee and then this is the little handle and that's why it's called the cup and handle or cup with handle pattern. Um, this isn't an ideal one because ideally the resistance would be identical. So this is sort of a cup and handle like pattern. It's also more of a V bottom and less of a rounded bottom. But if you can take all of that as a, uh, as a little uh, wiggle room, it's pretty close to that, which is a, 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 a bottoming pattern and then a short-term uh, you know, corrective pattern. The, the key to this pattern, though, is it's really not a buy signal until you break above resistance. So what's interesting here is you hit 92 back in November. You broke above it and then failed back below 92. You're now right at 92. I, I, you'd want to see this break above that 94 level, which would be the high from January. If it's able to do that, that would suggest further upside. That's really, at this point, what you'd be waiting for is a trigger of, uh, of further upside. 92 is now the line in the sand uh, as we recover a little bit. So if we hold here and start to roll over and break below that swing low, I think you have to feel a little more negative about you know, downside risk and thinking about some uh, more, more protection on the downside. But your question was really, where do we go from here? And there are a series of, of techniques which are based on measurements. I don't talk about them a ton only because I, I tend to lean more into trend following. So if a stock breaks out, I'm going to want to own, own that or, you know, theoretically be long that type of chart until the trend reverses. I'd, I'd rather just ride the trend higher, but there are some techniques you could use. And the two that would come to mind immediately, one is you take the height of the pattern and you project that higher. What's interesting about this is you're taking 58 to 94, which means you're measuring way off my monitor for, for potential upside here. The other thing you could do is take the height of that pattern and start applying a Fibonacci relationship. So do, if this is 100%, you could do 138%, which would be up here somewhere in my, uh, in my uh, navigation bar, uh, 150%, 162%, which sort of extends that Fibonacci relationship further and further to the, uh, to the upside. But just like my guest today, Jeff Greenblatt, talked about cycles. And just because a cycle comes due is not a signal on its own. You also want to understand the price movements relative to those cycle dates. I think it's the same thing. Just because you hit a certain supposed uh, price objective, I'm always going to want to understand the price movements and use that as a way of understanding what's, uh, what, what to expect uh, next on a, uh, on a chart. So that's the way I would break down Qualcomm. And again, I, for me, I, you know, we're right at the upper end of the range. If you're long at this point, I think that feels, you know, you, that's justifiable for sure. But at this point, you'd want to see a break above that resistance level, above the neckline is what you'd call it as a uh, suggestion of potential further upside. That's all the time we have for the final bar mailbag today. Again, thank you guys so much. Uh, we, we received so many great questions. And uh, please keep them coming. The final bar at stockcharts.com. We need to wrap the show, folks, though, and go to the three and three, three charts in three minutes. And here we go. Chart number one is looking at breadth in the form of the percent of stocks above their 200 day and above their 50 day moving averages. The 50 day the, at the bottom went from 0% in mid-March. That was even before the market low in March 23rd and went up to almost 100% uh, about, uh, about two, two and a half months later. Since then it's come off a little bit, got, came down to around 80%, which still means four out of five stocks in the S&P 500 remain above their 50 day moving average. What are, where a lot of them are at is right between the two. You can see that this is at 83%. Percent of stocks above their 200 day is around 41%, which means a lot of those stocks have broken down through their 200 day, but remain above their 50 day because they've come up so much off of the lows. I would love to see this get back above 50% if I want to feel confident about further, you know, an extended upside uh, for the equity markets. Chart number two is growth versus value. Again, I feel like every time I highlight this chart, pointing a potential breakdown, and I did it about a week or so ago, looking at this breakdown and thinking, all right, this might be it. Nope, it wasn't. This is a return of the growth trade. The large cap, mega cap growth story continues to work and, and value just is not happening as a theme until this really starts to break down. Uh, it's still favoring uh, growth over value, potentially looking now to see if it forms a lower peak from what we saw in mid-May uh, in mid and that would suggest for the downside. Finally, I just wanted to point out eight out of uh, 10 stocks on the New York Stock Exchange today finished lower. So even though the market 
uh, closed higher. A lot of stocks, I'm sorry, finished, finished higher. So, you know, the market gapped up, traded down into the close, but four out of five stocks closed higher than yesterday, which tells you that the weight of the evidence still short-term upside until proven otherwise. Folks, thanks so much for joining us on The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller from StockCharts.com. Be safe. Have a great night. Hey guys, Grayson Rose here with StockCharts.com. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Remember, if you did, give us a like down below, leave us a comment, we'd love to hear from you. And most importantly, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel for daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial minds. We'll see you back here very soon. Happy charting, my friends.